Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we'll get started. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, there's another hurricane. <laughs> so it seems like we have the absolute worst luck. That kind of just describes my life in general. Um, that's okay though. So because of the storm, because of the hurricane, we will not have class today, as you know. Uh, it's 7.30 a.m. right now. Most of you are all sleeping. I've been up since 5 o'clock in the morning because I'm a grandpa. Um, it's just what I do. But that's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of online lectures. Um, it's not going to be too long compared to before because um, it'll be a little bit shorter than usual because uh, as a result of the storm, we won't be having an in-class a Jeopardy review. I'm just going to make the Jeopardy PowerPoint and then I'm going to post that and we won't be able to really cover that in class. So that way we can maximize class time for what's most important. So um, I'll post an update and I've already emailed you and I'll post an update. Um, probably by the time you wake up, everything will already be posted and online um, and all the videos will be up. Um, mostly you get up at like, you know, 1 p.m. on an average day. Well, before we get started, I just want to get a quick update on this tropical storm and kind of see what's going on. Means at times of 155 miles an hour. Over on our wall, a look at the storm track. The forecasters today are expanding the area where the where the storm may hit. See this? Melbourne, Daytona Beach, all the way up to Jacksonville. This moves 20 miles to the west and you and everyone you know are dead. All of you. Because you can't survive it. It's not possible unless you're very, very lucky. And your kids die too. We have Team Fox coverage. Steve Harrigan is in Wabasso Beach in Florida with a look at how things are going there. But first, let's get to Janice Dean who's in the... Okay. Well, I guess there's no point of even continuing since we're all going to die and all of our kids are going to die. Unless we're lucky. And that probably doesn't describe any of us. Um, we'll continue anyways, though, just in case we happen to survive. So hopefully everyone stays safe, you know, in all realisticness, though, if that's even a word. Uh, this is a pretty severe hurricane, a, hur a category four. That's pretty crazy. Um, you know, we're talking like um, it's pretty bad. So hopefully all of you stay safe. If you know people on the East Coast, you know, they need to get evacuated. This is a pretty serious hurricane. Um, anyways, so we're going to go ahead and we'll go. We'll continue. We'll do a quick review of what we covered last class and then we'll move on. So last class, we started talking about genetics, and we said that Mendel, Gregor Mendel, um, good old guy, he did some experiments on pea plants, and he's the founder of genetics. He did these experiments, and he came up with these four observations, these four declarations, uh, which are extremely important. First, he said there's something called alleles. Alleles are just alternative versions of a gene because there's a different nucleotide sequence. He said these alternative versions of a gene these alleles account for the variations in the genes so we have a gene for eye color there's an allele for blue eye there's an allele for green eye there's an allele for brown eye we have or plants have genes for flower color there's a, fl a purple flower color allele a white flower color allele green flower color allele um and so forth so these alleles are found and these genes are found in a specific locus locus location a locus is a gene specific position on a chromosome it's almost like its parking spot those are two really important definitions and here's a picture of that let me get my pointer here's a picture of that here's the locus this is the parking spot for flower color gene it's reserved only for flower color gene only they can park here then if you're a purple flower color gene, you have this sequence, but this white one, it's just a slightly different sequence, but it plays a different role. So just this one nucleotide change means purple. This one nucleotide change means white. So based off our discussion last class, is this flower homozygous or heterozygous? They have one purple, one white. They'd be heterozygous, right? So then we said... Each organism has two alleles. You have two alleles for eye color. You got one from daddy, paternal. You got one from mama, and that's maternal. These two could be the same, and then we call them homozygous. They could be different, and then we call them heterozygous. Then we said if they're heterozygous, 
Well, the way you're going to look is based off the dominant allele. The dominant allele determines the way you look. The recessive allele, it's it's not just it's not absent, it's still there, but it just doesn't have a noticeable effect. So if you're heterozygous with a capital P, lowercase p, with a purple and with a white, you show up purple because that's what's dominant in this case. So dominant uses a capital letter and a recessive uses a lowercase letter. Purple would be capital P, but for white, which is recessive, we don't use lowercase p. We use the same letter, but we use a lowercase. Then Mendel said in egg or a sperm, the gametes that are produced, they only have one allele. They only have one allele for each trait. You may have two, one from dad, one from mom. But when you make your sperm, when you make your eggs, they only have one. Right now, as a guy, I'm cooking up some sperm right now, right? And in, if I select one of my sperm, there is going to be an allele for one allele for blonde hair. There's going to be one allele for extremely pale skin. There's going to be one allele for extremely corny jokes. There's going to be one allele for this. There's going to be one allele for that. Only one. Although I have two, we only choose one to put in each sperm and each egg. Which is why it's all kind of random. It's the law of segregation. They get These two alleles get split apart and only one goes into a sperm. Only one goes into an egg. This is why that each sperm and each egg could make a completely different organism because of how these alleles um, get segregated and separated. Then we said we could make a Punnett square, this diagram here, and then we could, um, and then we could use this to predict the way um, the, the offspring would look like and the gametes are going to get formed. So here's a picture of what Mendel did. He got a purple flower and a white flower. These are true breeding, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. They only, this is their genotype, and then they only can make in a, a gamete, a sperm or an egg that only has one of these. So it says, which one am I going to pick? A capital P or capital P? It doesn't matter. 100% of this flower's sperm are going to be capital P. 100% of this eggs or this woman's eggs are going to be lowercase p. She can't give a capital P. She doesn't have a capital P. So 100% of their offspring are going to be capital P, lowercase p, heterozygous. They are purple because purple is dominant. Then half of this offspring's Sperm are going to be capital P. Half of this offspring sperm are going to be lowercase p. Or if she's a girl, then half of her eggs will be this and that. Which is why when you breed these together, you're going to form these different traits. And you'll see this three to one relationship. We said there's a phenotype, which is the physical appearance. Whoa, you're ugly. Whoa, you have blonde hair. Whoa, you have blue eyes. Whoa, you have an addiction to alcohol. Whoa, you have tallness that's phenotype stuff you can see in the way they act in their behaviors genotype is something completely different genotype is your genetic makeup you can't see this but we can say it's based off of what i see your genotype is probably this or definitely is this so okay you're purple purple is dominant you're either homozygous dominant or you're heterozygous i don't know you're one of those so we use the terms homozygous dominant, capital P, capital P, homozygous recessive, lowercase, lowercase, two recessives. Heterozygous, you have one dominant and one recessive. And those are really important terms. The problem is this, like we just said. If you display the dominant phenotype, if you are purple, well, we don't quite know what you are. You could be homozygous dominant, because then you'd be purple, or you could be heterozygous but we just don't know. All we know is you're purple. You're one of those. To find out, we can do a test cross. And test crosses are really helpful for determining um, whether you are homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So what you do is you breed this mystery person. You breed this mystery purple person and say, hmm, I wonder if you're homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So you say, okay, go have sex with this white flower with a homozygous recessive individual. So they do, and then they make an offspring. And if any of those offspring have the recessive phenotype, that means, well, you have to be heterozygous. And I'll show you that. What are you? Are you capital P, capital P, homozygous dominant? Or are you heterozygous? I don't know. 
Let's go find out. Go have sex with this white flower. Okay, if all of your offspring are purple, that means you don't have the white allele in you. So you're definitely homozygous dominant. If any of your offspring are white, that means, well, you must be heterozygous because you have to have that white allele in there. So you can do that. All of you can do that with certain genes, and you can you can find out if you're if you are, have a dominant phenotype. You could just go find someone who's recessive and have a baby with her, or have a baby with them, and then find out what your genotype is. It's a little crazy, but you could actually. Same thing can, can be used with dogs. If you're if a capital B, which is dominant, that means that you have a black dog. If you have a lowercase B, that means you have a brown dog. If you want to know if your dog is homozygous dominant or heterozygous you say well buster go have sex with this brown dog so they go and, and mate and then if any of the offspring are brown that means well you have to be heterozygous if all buster's babies are black that means well okay you have to be homozygous dominant because all the offspring would be heterozygous so make a punnett square like we said draw the square Divide it into four squares, put the genotype up top, put the genotype on the left. Doesn't really matter where dad and mom are, but usually father goes up top, mother goes on the left. Um, and then you just drop down the alleles. So, square. So, genotype up top, genotype on the left. And then you just drop it down and drop it down and drop it down, drop it down, drop it over, drop it over, drop it over, drop it over. And then you get this. So this is what happens. 100% of this offspring of this homozygous dominant and heterozygous, 100% of their offspring is going to be round. So some of you, you say, I'm just going to keep having kids until I can get one that has a, you know, that has a straight hairline because I hate widow's peaks. Good for you. But the problem is this. Some of you might be trying forever because it's just not possible genetic wise. What if this couple said, I'm tired of having round babies. I want a wrinkly baby. Charlie give me a wrinkly baby. Let's keep having babies until I get a wrinkly one. Then we can stop. This couple will be going on for the rest of their life and they'll never be satisfied, right? They're never going to have a wrinkly baby. It's just not possible. Why? Because of the genetics. So in class, we did this practice problem and make sure you can do Punnett squares. I guarantee you that I'll be on the exam. So you want to make sure you can do that. The exam might not have you might not say, you know, make your Punnett square, draw this, and then that'll be part of your grade. But it could be ask a question that would say, if a two heterozygotes for this mated, what percentage of their offspring would be short? You'd have to do a, a, a Punnett square, and then you'd find, okay, only 25% will be short, 75% will be tall, and so forth. Then this is around where we left off last class, is there something called a dihybrid, which is where you do organisms that have two different genes we're looking at. So now we're going to look at seed color and shape. This is where it gets really complex. You start having Punnett squares that look like this. This will give you a heart attack, right? You're not going to have to do this on the exam, but the reality is it's actually not scary. You just drop down capital Y, capital R, capital Y, capital R, capital Y, capital R, capital Y, capital R capital Y, lowercase r. You just keep doing that and then moving these over, you get the same genotype. It's not scary. That's all you got to do. So when he started looking at this, he came up with something called the law of independent assortment. He said with when each of these alleles segregate, when they separate, they do so independently of each other. So what that means is this. This doesn't happen. If you have an... if round and yellow aren't linked it's not you're either round and yellow or you're either green and wrinkly that's not how it works right it's either you could be round and wrinkly you could be green and wrinkly you could be green and round and so forth so they're not linked they're are independent of each other they independently assort this only counts for genes that are on different chromosomes or those are on far apart on the same chromosome why because i'll show you this picture here law of independent assortment genes are only unlinked 
if they're on different non-homologous chromosomes. If one's like eye color on chromosome two and then hair color on chromosome four, those are not linked because of how far apart, because they're on different chromosomes. But if they're on the same chromosome, if they're located near each other, then they often are linked. A and B are often linked because what's the chance that these are going to get separated? There's not a ch good chance that crossing over is going to happen between these and these are going to flip flop. That's not a good chance that that's going to happen. But if they're far apart like A and C, there is a good chance that there's going to be a crossing over here and this dark blue and light blue are going to flip flop. They're going to switch watch. And all of a sudden now it's going to be capital A, capital B. This light blue lowercase c gets put over here like this. There's a good chance that'll happen. There's not a good chance it's going to be crossover just between these two because of how close they are. There is really not a good chance of that. So if they're close together, they tend to be inherited. They tend to be linked and inherited together. If they're far apart on the same chromosome, they tend to be follow this law of independent assortment. Or if they are on different chromosomes, they tend to follow this law of independent assortment. And that's extremely important. Why? Because the chance of a crossing over event happening between these. So like we said, alleles are not linked. You don't have to be only round and yellow. You don't have to be only green and wrinkly. When this happens, you could be round and yellow. You could be green and round. You could be yellow and wrinkly. You could be green and round and green and wrinkly. A dihybrid cross always sees this relationship of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. What that means is, is if you have 16 children, probably 9 of those 16 will be yellow and round. 3 of them will be green and round. 3 of them will be yellow and wrinkly. 1 of them will be green and, ra green and wrinkly. The same thing can be considered for dogs. You have a black dog with normal vision, a black dog that's blind, a brown dog with normal vision, and then a brown dog that's blind. Being normal vision is dominant. Being black is dominant. You breed a heterozygote, capital B, lowercase b, capital N, lowercase n, with a, a heterozygote, the same thing, Nine of the offspring will be black, normal vision. Three of them will be black and blind. Three of them will be brown and normal. One of them will be brown and blind. It's just the way it happens. The same thing here. The same thing. So for a monohybrid cross, we always see this nine to th or for a monohybrid cross with one different allele, we always see a three to one phenotypic relationship. Three are dominant. One is recessive. Three are purple. One is white. For dihybrid with two different genes, we always see a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. 9 are dominant for A and B. 3 are dominant for A and recessive for B. 3 are dominant for B and recessive for A. And 1 is recessive for both A and B. And that's extremely important to understand. 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 and 3 to 1. So these things we talk about with genetics, this is all based off the rules of probability. In a majors class, I would talk about math and how that plays a role here. We're not really gonna do that here. But we're gonna find is this. It's all based off the rules of probability. So it's just like tossing a coin. When you, when you flip a coin and you get heads, and then you flip a coin and you get heads, two heads in a row. Wow, you're a lucky boy. The reality is this, just because you got two heads in a row doesn't mean you're more likely to get tails the next time. That's not true. You still have a 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails. If you have a boy and a boy and a boy, you don't have a better chance of having a girl. You still have a 50% chance of having a boy and a 50% chance of having a girl. The same thing happens with these. If you are this plant if you are this plant here then you have a 50 percent chance of giving capital y a 50 percent chance of giving lowercase y you have a 50 percent chance of giving capital r 
50% chance of giving this. They're independent of each other. It doesn't matter. If one happens, then you flip it again, and another happens, they're unrelated. The same thing is like flipping a coin. So there's a condition called polydactyly, which is where you have extra fingers and extra toes. You don't have five, you have six or seven, right? So polydactyly, that sounds like something that we talked about where your fingers and toes are joined together. Does anybody remember what that's called? So that's called syndactyly. Those fingers and toes are joined together. Do you remember why that happened? Because apoptosis cell suicide didn't happen between those finger cells or between those toe cells. Apoptosis cell suicide. We give the cell a signal and say, kill yourself. And then it does. So polydactyly is something different. You just have poly means many. You just have an extra finger or an extra toe. This is a dominant. Polydactyly is caused by a dominant allele. If you have one dominant allele, you have polydactyly. So you might not remember a single thing about me besides I'm, besides the fact that, um, I don't know. But you might not remember very much about me, but I have five fingers. You haven't seen my toes, but I have five toes. So think about that really quick. Do I have a dominant allele if I have five fingers and five toes on each hand? No, because if I were to have a dominant allele, that means I would have six fingers, six toes. Look at yourself. Count your fingers and count your toes. Don't, you know, don't think you know. Just double check. You should have five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. So if you do that, and if you look, oh, cool i have you know five fingers in, on each hand and five toes on each foot that means you don't have polydactyly so what does that mean your genotype is that means you have to be recessive recessive so you're homozygous recessive if one of you has a six toe that you just found well that means you have to have at least one dominant allele in fact well you might have two but you have to have at least one so one out of 400 individuals, one out of 400 babies are born with polydactyly. So you've met more than 400 people in your life. You've met thousands of people in your life. You've met someone that has polydactyly. I can guarantee it. That's pretty crazy to think about. But you've met someone that has polydactyly. They may have gotten it cut off, but they had it at one point and they still have their genetics. So here is polydactyly. It could look nice and pretty like this, you know, six fingers. In fact, if I had this, I would keep it because I just think this is cool. Over here, these aren't as pretty to look at. Um, so here's a little girl. I guess she wrote a little letter to a doctor. You know, chop this one off. You know, not these other ones. This is the one that needs to go. Um, so um, this is just a picture of polydactyly. Um, and it is due to a dominant allele. So these people have a dominant allele. They might have two. They might be homozygous dominant or they could be heterozygous but they at least have this dominant allele. So if an individual has polydactyly, what does their genotype have to be? Think about it for a second. What must their genotype be? Even though I just said it, they have to be homozygous dominant, capital P, lowercase p, or heterozygous. I'm sorry, capital P, capital P for homozygous dominant or heterozygous, capital P, lowercase p. So do this really quick. I want you to make a Punnett square. A father is homozygous dominant, capital P, capital P, for polydactyly. A mother is homozygous recessive, lowercase p, lowercase p. What is the probability their, ch their child will have an extra finger or toe? Do a Punnett square really quick and pause the video, and then um, we'll see what you get. So hopefully you just completed the Punnett square and you found dad can only give a capital P, mom can only give a lowercase p. So that means 100% of their children will have an extra finger or toe. Don't believe me? Just watch. The father can only give a capital P, the mother can only give a lowercase p. 100% of their offspring are going to be heterozygous. 
100% of the offspring will have polydactyly. So while this could be a, the cutest couple in the world, right? 100% of their kids will have polydactyly. Even if you chop off, go to the doctor and do surgery and get rid of this, you still have the genes for polydactyly. So even though you only have five fingers and toes now because you got a nice surgery and you look really pretty, it doesn't matter. You still have the genes inside of you and you'll pass it on to your children. So pretty crazy. If you were homozygous dominant, all of your children would definitely have polydactyly. With this, we come with a really important realization. Whoa, polydactyly is dominant. But, well, most people don't have polydactyly. In fact, 399 out of 400 people don't have polydactyly. So that means this. Dominant alleles, they are not necessarily more common than recessive. That's not the case. Dominant does not mean more common. Recessive does not mean less common. In fact, you are more common to be homozygous recessive for polydactyly. As you know, because most of the people you see have five fingers and five toes. So the dominant allele is very not common or very uncommon in this. Most people have five fingers and five toes. So this is just the case where the recessive allele is far more prevalent. That's not always the case, but you can never think of dominant is common and recessive is not common, uncommon. And that's extremely, extremely important. So here are some different things. It's dominant to have freckles. Freckles is a dominant allele. It's dominant to have a widow's peak. It's dominant to have a free earlobe. It's recessive to have these. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Go, go look in the mirror and see, what is my hairline? Oh, you got a widow's peak. Nice. So do I. That means you have one dominant allele, or you might have two. If you have a straight hairline, I already know what your genotype is. What is it? You're not capital, capital, you're not capital lowercase. You are definitely homozygous recessive. Because if you were to have one capital, you'd have a widow's peak. Oh, you don't have freckles? I already know your genotype. I don't have freckles. I already know my genotype. I'm lowercase, lowercase. I'm definitely homozygous recessive. So with this, we come up with some important terms based off what's most common, what's least common, or what's most common, what's not most common. So a wild type is the normal phenotypes that are most commonly seen in the population. The normal phenotypes that are commonly seen. And we would give that a superscript for the wild type. So it is common, it's most common to have five fingers and five toes. It's most common to have no freckles and so forth. So we will use a term called a mutant, which means you have a phenotype that's not the wild type. It's not the most common one. And we would not put a superscript there. So if you look at this, I hate this next slide. It's one of my least favorite slides. But it brings, I guess, a weird point in science that I think is a little inappropriate. But wild type is the most common phenotype. So because of that, freckles is dominant. The absence of freckles is recessive. So if you don't have freckles, that means you're the wild type. I am a wild type. All of you are probably, most of you are wild type. That's why it's wild type. It's the most common. But if you have freckles... It's less common, and that's okay, but we call you a mutant. That's pretty rough, but that's just the term I guess they use, just less common. So this dude, well, he has some good muscles. He's probably a really nice guy. He's a mutant, and she, I'm sure she's so nice. I'm sure she donates a lot to charity, but she's still apparently a mutant. So she has, uh, it's less common to have freckles. So um, that's just the term they use. It's not wild type. Nothing's wrong with them. They're still awesome people. Um, but it's just a less common trait. Although even they have a dominant thing, and dominant sounds good, um, and dominant is good. Freckles are nice, right? But that's just the way it works. It's less common, so we call that um, the mutant. And most common is freckles. So I think this is a really good point to stop, and we'll pick up on the next video. Um, so this is the end of part one. There will be a couple more parts that will be uploaded as well. So stay safe.
uh, and see you soon.